Greetings, listeners. We're back once again to talk to you about the Cthulhu Mythos, its books, its monsters, its unfortunate human casualties, its timeline in general, and even its tangential bits like the dreamlands, or things of a weird nature, or things that are lovecrafty and leaning, weird fiction, science fiction, horror, learn of terrible meetings in lonely places, of cyclopean ruins, and vast staircases that lead down to abysses of knighted secrets, of complex angles that lead through invisible walls to other regions of space and time, and of hideous explorations in remote and forbidden places on other worlds and in different time-space continua. From the creation of our galaxy to the death of the sun, this is an exploration of the Cthulhu mythos from the perspective of humans' concept of history. We are the People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. You can find us at pgttcm.com, pgttcm.podbean.com, and you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos starts now. The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Season 8. Greetings and welcome to The People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. I am your host, D.B. Spitzer. And between episodes, let's see... 107 and 134, we will be talking about the beetle. The beetle, a mystery, is a 1897 horror novel by British writer Richard Marsh. To tell you about it is to spoil it. So check it out, and that'll be going on from now until sometime in December. This episode is brought to you by FoundOutOnClothing.com and BunnySlippers.com. Subscribe to PGTTCM with D.B. Spitzer and Seraphie. Wherever you subscribe to podcasts, we prefer Podbean and Apple Podcasts. Check out the new website over at PGTTCM.com and check out the merch table over at PGTTCM.Threadless.com. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at PGTTCM. Or check us out on YouTube at People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. Edited by Daniel Spitzer. Music by Kevin McLeod, featuring The Hive, Ghost Story, Ghost Processional, Oppressive Gloom, and our theme song, The Chamber. The Beetle by Richard Marsh. Book Three, The Terror by Night and The Terror by Day. Miss Marjorie Linden tells the tale. Chapter 23, The Way He Told Her. I am the happiest woman in the world, I wonder how many women have said that of themselves in their time, but I am. Paul has told me that he loves me. How long I have made inward confession of my love for him, I should be ashamed to say. It sounds prosaic, but I believe it is a fact that the first stirring of my pulses was caused by the report of a speech of his, which I read in the Times. It was on the eight hours bill. Papa was most unflattering. He said that he was an oily spouter, an ignorant agitator, an irresponsible firebrand, and a good deal more to the same effect. I remember very well how Papa fidgeted with the paper, declaring that it read even worse than it had sounded, and goodness knew that it had sounded bad enough. He was so very emphatic that when he had gone... I thought I would see what all the pother was about and read the speech for myself. So I read it. It affected me quite differently. The speaker's words showed such knowledge, charity and sympathy that they went straight to my heart. After that, I read everything of Paul Lessingham's which I came across. And the more I read, the more I was impressed. But it was some time before we met. Considering what Papa's opinions were, it was not likely that he would go out of his way to facilitate a meeting. 
To him, the mere mention of the name was like a red rag to a bull, but at last we did meet. And then I knew that he was stronger, greater, better even than his words. It is so often the other way. One finds that men and women too are so apt to put their best, as it were, into their shop windows, that the discovery was as novel as it was delightful. When the ice was once broken, we often met. I do not know how it was. We did not plan our meetings, at first at any rate. Yet we seemed always meeting. Seldom a day passed on which we did not meet, sometimes twice or thrice. It was odd how we were always coming across each other in the most unlikely places. I believe we did not notice it at the time, but looking back I can see that we must have managed our engagements so that somewhere, somehow, we should be certain to have an opportunity of exchanging half a dozen words. Those constant encounters could not have all been chance ones. But I never supposed he loved me, never. I'm not even sure that for some time I was aware that I loved him. We were great on friendship, both of us. I was quite aware that I was his friend, that he regarded me as his friend. He told me so more than once. I tell you this, he would say, referring to this, that or the other, because I know that in speaking to you, I am speaking to a friend. With him, those were not empty words. All kinds of people talk to one like that, especially men. It is a kind of formula which they use with every woman who shows herself disposed to listen. But Paul is not like that. He is chary of speech, not by any means a woman's man. I tell him that is his weakest point. If legend does not lie more even than is common, few politicians have achieved prosperity without the aid of women. He replies that he is not a politician, that he never means to be a politician. He simply wishes to work for his country. If his country does not need his services, well, let it be. Papa's political friends have always so many axes of their own to grind that, at first, to hear a member of Parliament talk like that was almost disquieting. I had dreamed of men like that, but I never encountered one till I met Paul Lessingham. Our friendship was a pleasant one. It became pleasanter and pleasanter, until there came a time when he told me everything, the dreams he dreamed, the plans which he had planned, the great purposes which, if health and strength were given him, he intended to carry to a great fulfilment. And at last, he told me something else. It was after a meeting at a working women's club in Westminster. He had spoken, and I had spoken too. I don't know what Papa would have said if he had known, but I had. A formal resolution had been proposed, and I had seconded it, in perhaps a couple of hundred words. But that would have been quite enough for Papa to have regarded me as an abandoned wretch. Papa always puts those sort of words into capitals. Papa regards a speechifying woman as a thing of horror. I have known him look askance at a primrose dame. The night was fine. Paul proposed that I should walk with him down the Westminster Bridge Road until we reached the house and then he would see me into a cab. I did as he suggested. It was still early, not yet ten, and the streets were alive with people. Our conversation as we went was entirely political. The Agricultural Amendment Act was then before the Commons, and Paul felt very strongly that it was one of those measures which give with one hand while taking with the other. The committee stage was at hand, and already several amendments were threatened, the effect of which would be to strengthen the landlord at the expense of the tenant. More than one of these, and they not the most moderate, were to be proposed by Papa. 
Paul was pointing out how it would be his duty to oppose these tooth and nail, when all at once he stopped. "'I sometimes wonder how you really feel upon this matter.' "'What matter?' "'On the difference of opinion in political matters which exists between your father and myself. "'I am conscious that Mr. Linden regards my action as a personal question "'and resents it so keenly that I am sometimes moved to wonder "'if at least a portion of his resentment is not shared by you. "'I have explained. "'I consider Papa the politician as one person, "'and Papa the father is quite another.' You are his daughter. Certainly I am, but would you, on that account, wish me to share his political opinions, even though I believe them to be wrong? You love him? Of course I do. He is the best of fathers. Your defection will be a grievous disappointment. I looked at him out of the corner of my eye. I wondered what was passing through his mind. The subject of my relations with Papa was one which, without saying anything at all about it, we had consented to taboo. I am not so sure. I am permeated with the suspicion that Papa has no politics. Miss Linden, I fancy that I can adduce proof to the contrary. I believe that if Papa were to marry again, say, a home ruler... Within three weeks, his wife's politics would be his own. Paul thought before he spoke. Then he smiled. I suppose that men sometimes do change their coats to please their wives, even their political ones. Papa's opinions are the opinions of those with whom he mixes. The reason why he consorts with Tories of the crusted school is because he fears that if he associated with anybody else, with radicals, say, before he knew it, he would be a radical too. With him, association is synonymous with logic. Paul laughed outright. By this time, we had reached Westminster Bridge. Standing, we looked down upon the river. A long line of lanterns was gliding mysteriously over the waters, it was a tug, towing a string of barges. For some moments neither spoke. Then Paul recurred to what I had just been saying. And you? Do you think marriage would colour your convictions? Would it yours? That depends. He was silent. Then he said... In that tone which I had learned to look for when he was most in earnest. It depends on whether you would marry me. I was still. His words were so unexpected that they took my breath away. I knew not what to make of them. My head was in a whirl. Then he addressed to me a monosyllabic interrogation. Well? I found my voice. Or a part of it. Well, to what? He came a little closer. Will you be my wife? The part of my voice which I had found was lost again. Tears came into my eyes. I shivered. I had not thought that I could be so absurd. Just then, the moon came from behind the cloud. The rippling waters were tipped with silver. He spoke again so gently that his words just reached my ears. You know that I love you. Then I knew that I loved him too. That what I had fancied was a feeling of friendship was something very different. It was as if somebody, in tearing a veil from before my eyes, had revealed a spectacle which dazzled me. I was speechless. He misconstrued my silence. Have I offended you? No. I fancy that he noted the tremor which was in my voice and read it rightly, for he too was still.
Presently his hand stole along the parapet and fastened upon mine and held it tight. And that was how it came about. Other things were said, but they were hardly of the first importance, though I believe we took some time in saying them. Of myself I can say with truth that my heart was too full for copious speech. I was dumb with a great happiness, and I believe I can say the same of Paul. He told me as much when we were parting. It seemed that we had only just come there when Paul started. Turning, he stared up at Big Ben. Midnight? The house up? Impossible! But it was more than possible. It was fact. We had actually been on the bridge two hours, and it had not seemed ten minutes. Never had I supposed that the flight of time could have been so entirely unnoticed. Paul was considerably taken aback. His legislative conscience pricked him. He excused himself in his own fashion. Fortunately, for once in a way, my business in the house was not so important as my business out of it. He had his arm through mine. We were standing face to face. So you call this business? He laughed. He not only saw me into a cab, but he saw me home in it. And in the cab, he kissed me. I fancy I was a little out of sorts that night. My nervous system was perhaps demoralized, because when he kissed me, I did a thing which I never do. I have my own standard of behavior, and that sort of thing is quite outside of it. I behaved like a sentimental chit. I cried, and it took him all the way to my father's door to comfort me. I can only hope that, perceiving the singularity of the occasion, he consented to excuse me. End of chapter 23 Recording by Ruth Golding Chapter 24 A Woman's View Sidney Atherton has asked me to be his wife. It is not only annoying, worse, it is absurd. This is the result of Paul's wish that our engagement should not be announced. He is afraid of Papa. Not really, but for the moment. The atmosphere of the house is charged with electricity. Party feeling runs high. They are at each other hammer and tongs about this Agricultural Amendment Act. The strain on Paul is tremendous. I am beginning to feel positively concerned. Little things which I have noticed about him lately convince me that he is being overwrought. I suspect him of having sleepless nights. The amount of work which he has been getting through lately has been too much for any single human being. I care not who he is. He himself admits that he shall be glad when the session is at an end. So shall I. In the meantime, it is his desire that nothing shall be said about our engagement until the house rises. It is reasonable enough. Papa is sure to be violent. Lately, the barest allusion to Paul's name has been enough to make him explode. When the discovery does come, he will be unmanageable. I foresee it clearly. From little incidents which have happened recently, I predict the worst. He will be capable of making a scene within the precincts of the house. And as Paul says, there is some truth in the saying that the last straw breaks the camel's back. He will be better able to face Papa's wild wrath when the house has risen. So the news is to bide a wee. Of course Paul is right, and what he wishes I wish too. Still, it is not all such plain sailing for me as he perhaps thinks. The domestic atmosphere is almost as electrical as that in the house. 
Papa is like the terrier who scents a rat. He is always sniffing the air. He has not actually forbidden me to speak to Paul. His courage is not quite at the sticking point, but he is constantly making uncomfortable allusions to persons who number among their acquaintance political adventurers, grasping carpet baggers, radical riffraff, and that kind of thing. Sometimes I venture to call my soul my own. But such a tempest invariably follows that I become discreet again as soon as I possibly can. So, as a rule, I suffer in silence. Still, I would with all my heart that the concealment were at an end. No one need imagine that I am ashamed of being about to marry Paul, Papa least of all. On the contrary. I am as proud of it as a woman can be. Sometimes, when he has said or done something unusually wonderful, I fear that my pride will out. I do feel it so strong within me. I should be delighted to have a trial of strength with Papa anywhere at any time. I should not be so rude to him as he would be to me. At the bottom of his heart, Papa knows that I am the more sensible of the two. After a pitched battle or so, he would understand it better still. I know Papa. I have not been his daughter for all these years in vain. I feel like hot-blooded soldiers must feel who, burning to attack the enemy in the open field, are ordered to skulk behind hedges and be shot at. One result is that Sydney has actually made a proposal of marriage. He, of all people, it is too comical. The best of it was that he took himself quite seriously. I do not know how many times he has confided to me the sufferings which he has endured for love of other women. Some of them, I am sorry to say, decent married women too. But this is the first occasion on which the theme has been a personal one. He was so frantic as he is wont to be that, to calm him, I told him about Paul, which, under the circumstances, to him I felt myself at liberty to do. In return, he was melodramatic, hinting darkly at I know not what. I was almost cross with him. He is a curious person, Sidney Atherton. I suppose it is because I have known him all my life, and have always looked upon him in cases of necessity as a capital substitute for a brother, that I criticise him with so much frankness. In some respects, he is a genius. In others, I will not write fool, for that he never is, though he has often done some extremely foolish things. The fame of his inventions is in the mouths of all men, though the half of them has never been told. He is the most extraordinary mixture. The things which most people would like to have proclaimed in the street, he keeps tightly locked in his own bosom, while those which the same persons would be only too glad to conceal, he shouts from the roofs. A very famous man once told me that if Mr. Atherton chose to become a specialist, to take up one branch of inquiry and devote his life to it, his fame before he died would bridge the spheres. But sticking to one thing is not in Sydney's line at all. He prefers, like the bee, to roam from flower to flower. As for his being in love with me. It is ridiculous. He is as much in love with the moon. I cannot think what has put the idea into his head. Some girl must have been ill-using him, or he imagines that she has. The girl whom he ought to marry, and whom he ultimately will marry, is Dora Grayling. She is young, charming, immensely rich, and over head and ears in love with him. 
If she were not, then he would be over head and ears in love with her. I believe he is very near it, as it is. Sometimes he is so very rude to her. It is a characteristic of Sidney's that he is apt to be rude to a girl whom he really likes. As for Dora, I suspect she dreams of him. He is tall, straight, very handsome, with a big moustache and the most extraordinary eyes. I fancy that those eyes of his have as much to do with Dora's state as anything. I have heard it said that he possesses the hypnotic power to an unusual degree, and that if he chose to exercise it, he might become a danger to society. I believe he has hypnotized Dora. He makes an excellent brother. I have gone to him many and many a time for help, and some excellent advice I have received. I dare say I shall consult him still. There are matters of which one would hardly dare to talk to Paul. In all things he is the great man. He could hardly condescend to chiffons. Now Sidney can and does. When he is in the mood on the vital subject of trimmings, a woman could not appeal to a sounder authority. I tell him, if he had been a dressmaker, he would have been magnificent. I'm sure he would. End of chapter 24 Recording by Ruth Golding